Hello, hello, hello. Oh, wait. Ah, that's better. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you, everybody who is here. I so I am a little bit nervous about today's live stream. Uh, a few weeks ago, we planned out the um the essential story for a new novella I'm writing. And in today's live stream, what I'm going to do is actually plan the scenes. Uh you guys, if you've been around the channel a while, you've seen me go through these six scene planning questions that I use to kind of find the magic and the consequences in every scene. And so that's what I'm going to do, but I'm going to be doing it live. And so, you know, you're going to be seeing kind of a more real version of this. You're going to be seeing me um, look at possibilities and then reject them and then go back. And it's going to be more you know, just more real. It's going to be the real thing. So the uh, the novella we're planning today is um, how oh, hi, Meredith. Meredith says that she's looking forward to the live stream. Thank you so much for being here, Meredith. I'm, I'm so excited that you showed up. Um, and yeah, so the novella that we're planning today is, um, well, I haven't got a name for it, honestly. Right now I'm calling it All for the Money, which I'm a little... A little iffy on. I I really see the value of a good title, and I can recognize them when I see them. But I'm not great at titles personally, so I am going to keep working that one. But in any event, all for the money, as it's currently called, is about my. It's about the protagonist of my Kitty Callahan series, and she is a secretary to a hard-boiled detective in 1920s Chicago. And in this novella, she's going to be trapped in a bank during a robbery. So I'm just going to look at the chat again. Oh, Meredith says, yay. Yay to you too, Meredith. Uh, let's get going. Okay, so the first scene in this novella is going to be uh, the scene where we establish Kitty's chronic issue. So we've talked about this before on the channel. Uh, the chronic issue is just the longstanding problem that your character is going to deal with in this story. Whatever is happening in the story is her acute issue. It's going on right now. It demands action, but it's going to give her the opportunity to finally confront that long-standing issue. And in Kitty's case, that long-standing issue is going to be that she needs money. Uh, and she actually, she has access to money. She has access to some stock certificates that her uncle stole years and years ago, but she doesn't know if she should spend them. She doesn't feel it's totally safe to do so. So we are going to just go through my scene planning questions for this first scene. So I like to name, oh, wait, sorry. Let me share the screen to you guys. Uh, it's not really big. Enough. Okay, there, there. So now you can see me, but you can also see the Scrivener window that I'm working in. Scrivener is by far my favorite, uh, my favorite software for writing in. I love it. I am a Scriven evangelist, and um, I, I think if you haven't tried it out, you absolutely should. But mostly, I'm going to be working in this window here. This is my custom metadata that I created for my writing template, and it just has all my scene questions right here on the side so that I can type in my answers. And then when I'm ready to write the scene over here in this window, I have this information to reference. So I like to give my scenes funny little names, or at least they're funny to me. Okay. So this first scene is going to be called just an ordinary day. And that's what Kitty is thinking it is when the robbers show up. So what does Kitty want at the beginning of the scene? Honestly, not much. Uh, the first scene, sometimes it can be kind of special in that you don't necessarily have to follow the rules you'd normally follow for a scene. Maybe, you know, Maybe your character doesn't have much of a want when it starts up. Um, maybe it's not even from the perspective of the character who will be narrating most of the book. You can break the rules in that first scene. Um, so what does the character want? I'm going to put not much. So I think I'm just going, well, no, actually what she wants is I want those stock certificates. She's just 
standing there in line and she is thinking about, um, she's just mulling over her financial situation, or mewling. Uh, she's thinking about the specific things she wants to buy. Maybe, you know, her shoe has a hole in the toe. And um, so she's, she's just kind of irritated. She's wanting to go for those stock certificates. And does she get it? She's going to decide no. But typically, when I answer this question, I either make it no and furthermore, a consequence for pursuing that goal. Or yes, but a consequence for pursuing that goal. And that's a tip that I take from Carolyn Wheat's book, um, How to Write Killer Fiction. If you haven't read that, that that is a really good read. It's Carolyn Wheat, How to Write Killer Fiction. Um, but again, first scene, don't have to obey all the rules. Um, there's really no dialogue. Uh, the activity is just going to be waiting in line at bank and um, waiting in line at the bank. And I think what I want to do actually to keep this scene a little bit entertaining is I want to start giving you sort of pre-introductions for some of the characters. So uh, in the last live stream, we talked about how this will be a novella where the essential twist the surprise ending is an inside job. It will turn out that the mastermind of the bank robbers is in fact one of the hostages. So I want to introduce you to a few of the hostages over the course of the novella to kind of keep that one mastermind hidden in plain sight. And so I think I will give them nice solid introductions in later scenes. But at this point, I'm just going to kind of give you glimpses of them. Um, let's see. Um, I do want a matronly character. Um, and I can't come up with the name for this character, I think. Um, I just, I want something sort of slightly stodgy and slightly humorous. And yet whenever I try to come up with a name for her, I come up with something extremely stodgy and humorous, like Mrs. Wilberforce or Mrs. Throttlebottom or Mrs. Belvedere. And and that's 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 too much. Uh, I need to tone it down a little bit. Um, I need something, you know, slightly humorous, like Mrs. Mertz, except this is not I Love Lucy. And so I cannot use Mertz because you would definitely think Ethel Mertz. Um, so we'll just call her Mrs. Wilberforce for right now, but I do feel like that's got to come down a little bit. Meredith says, your idea for using the census database is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I, I have been doing that for years and it never fails to give me a collection of names that I'm really into. Um, so we'll just see her briefly. Maybe, you know, Kitty will do something slight that gets on her nerves um, and she'll get a real introduction later on. Um, and then strategies for scene partner A and B. There's nothing but the final note is there are bank robbers coming in. So this is just going to be a brief scene, maybe a page. Ordinary day, establish Kitty's chronic issue that she wants that money, and then boom, everything goes haywire. Miss Edith. Lynette, Lynette says I should call this character Miss Edith, and I love the name Edith. Miss, Mrs. Mrs. Edith Wilberforce. Or now, I, Wilberforce. It's still, it's still too, nah, needs to come down. Um, okay, so second scene is, yeah, I called it be cool because that's going to be the central question in this scene. Is Kitty going to just be cool? Like I would be in a bank robbery. I mean, not that I'd feel cool, but that I would not get involved. I would just, hey, just lay back. I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to just endure this and wind up coming home to see my kids at the end of the day. Um, so, or is she going to get involved? And I feel like, yeah. So I wrote, 
just a few notes before I started. I feel like the only reason that she's going to get involved is because there's a threat. So maybe one of the hostages is getting shot and actually is about to get shot. And actually, let's make this the introduction for another of our characters. Let's make this the introduction for our bank manager character. Um, so what does Kitty want? Prevent manager from being killed. Does she get it? Um, yes, because we're not ready to spill out any blood yet, just here on page like three. But what is going to be the consequence that she could experience for that? Um, I'm just going to briefly read the chat. Anne says, another census hit from a genealogist. Play attention to the era your character was born. Find comic names that fit that era to show their age. Yes, totally. Yes. Um, and that is what I do. And what I actually use is the Social Security Administration. So you, um, yeah, I think it's ssa.gov, but you can just search for most popular baby names by decade. And so that that is a great hit because that's what I always do. And it just, yeah, it gives it that right feel. So most I'm writing in the 1920s. Um, I figure most of my characters are around 20. So I just search for the decade 1900. And then I get lovely names like Norma and Mavis and, uh, you know, Dottie. And it's fantastic. Um, uh, okay, so does she get it? Yes. But what's her consequence? Uh, the most obvious consequence, it seems to me, is that she's going to make one or all of the bank robbers mad at her, or at least draw their attention to her. So now she can't simply just be cool and fade into the background. She's got to, you know, she's going to drag, draw attention no matter what goes on for the rest of the novel. So, um, Yes, but now she's in the spotlight. If dialogue accompanied by what activity? Okay, so there's probably not, I probably don't need an activity to keep the second half of this scene strong. Let me explain this question a little bit. So, um, so when you have characters who are having a long conversation, sometimes you can get this kind of talking head feel to your scene where uh, your readers are hearing the people talk, but they're not really seeing them. It's not, it doesn't really give you that movie feel. And so the very easy way to do this, to fix this is just to give them an activity, give them a chess game to play, give them a, um, you know, some yarn to wind, give them, give them anything really that they can do with their hands. And then not only does that prevent the talking head problem, but also it gives them a way to, um, to express their emotion. If, you know, your character is knitting and she's getting really tight on her stitches because she's just getting so angry, you know, that is a much easier way to express how she's feeling than to have to actually like say that she said something angrily or, um, you know, or for her to do anything bigger with her body to express her anger. You know, she, in order to actually yell at people or actually, you know, slam your fist down, you have to really own your anger. But when you've got something in your hands that you can just sort of strangle a little bit, um, you don't have to own that anger and it can be very subtle. And this is, uh, a great way of just getting across your character's unexpressed emotions. Um, yes, exactly. Lisa says activity during dialogue equals subtext. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that is exactly what we are talking about here. So I feel like at the very beginning of this scene, Kitty's going to be sitting down with hostages, the hostages, um, before there becomes a situation where she has to prevent somebody from getting shot. And at this point, yeah, they're going to have a brief little discussion about what should we do? 
Uh, we need to all stay cool. We need to all just turtle down and make sure we don't get in any trouble. And can I give them anything physical to do? I mean, that's tough because obviously if you are a bank robber, the very last thing you want to do is put objects in your hostages' hands. Um, you're kind of trying to keep them from doing anything physical. Um, okay. If I had a hostage who was pregnant, they could be trying to get this woman comfortable. They could be trying to get a cushion or settle her down. And so, I don't know. Pregnant hostage just is too much like Chekhov's gun to me. Like you, you see a pregnant hostage on page two and you expect her to accidentally deliver on page 40, right? Um, so... What else is another activity that um, that they could sort of engage in to give them a way to talk a little bit more naturally? Um, okay, maybe if the hostages, maybe if the bank robbers are having them hand over their personal valuables and objects. Um, oh, actually, actually, okay. This is an interesting inspiration. Kitty could easily have a gun. Kitty works for a private investigator. She owns a gun. She could have a gun in her purse. So this could be a point where Kitty is trying to stash the gun because she's afraid the robbers are going to ask for their purses. Yeah, so... I think the the activity that's going to be accompanying the early dialogue is going to be a little back and forth with um, trying to stash the gun. Uh, and, you know, just mm, purses here and there, you know. Um, Okay, so Anne says, why is she taking a bullet for him? Romance, coworker, or just because she's heroic? Um, I mean, she's definitely not going to take a bullet for him. She doesn't think it's going to get to that point. Um, so what she's probably going to do instead is just try and... Uh, sorry, one minute. Sweetheart, What? Uh, what's up? If you can't reach Yaya, that's okay, buddy. You can just do some educational stuff while, while you wait for me. Sorry. Um, she's not taking a bullet for him. Uh, she's trying to distract or diffuse the situation. Uh, because, you know, she doesn't want him to get shot. I suppose that is a little heroic, but it's not quite at that climax of a book level of heroic. Not just yet, anyway. Um So, yeah, to keep in mind, okay, so here is where I want to put in real character introductions for Mrs. Wilberforce, for Flora, who I think is going to be our guilty mastermind hostage, and for the bank manager who doesn't have a name right now, let's call him Mr. No, that's too... I was about to call him Beasley, but it's just it's just too weaselly and silly. Um, ah, Mr. Manager for now. Um, oh, I don't think I can give them all an intro in this scene, but obviously Mr. Manager is going to get his intro. He's going to get a intro and his action is going to be um yeah it's going to be trying to stand up to the hostages to the bank robbers and 
let's see, what else do I have on my, I, I do have some questions that I typically ask myself when I'm going to introduce a character, which is, uh, how do I establish their voice? Um, do we show a, a contradiction within their character, something sort of internal, which for a minor character, like the bank manager, I don't feel that's really needed. You know, you always hear about how your character should be deep and really what they should be is deep enough for their role. So his, his role, it isn't going to be that big. He's just sort of part of the cloud of hostages to distract you from my guilty hostage. Uh, he doesn't need an internal contradiction. But yeah, uh, what will the emotion evoked by his intro B is going to be, you know, fear because we're scared he's going to be killed and visually interesting. Um, yeah. So obviously it's visually interesting when somebody is being held at gunpoint. Is there a way I can make that a little bit more spicy? Um, You know, I think it's okay. I think I think being held at gunpoint is enough. Um, and then let's talk about strategies for scene partner A and strategies for scene partner B. Okay, here is where we really find the tension in our scenes. Um, so Kitty has a want, which is to stop him from being killed. And her scene partner is going to be the person who's kind of working against her. So that's going to be one of the bank robbers. And I sort of have three of them in my mind, which is Cal, the leader, Vince, the kind of angry, aggressive, um, kind of off kilter one, and Billy, who is perhaps the younger brother of one of these. And he calls himself Bill, but everybody calls him Billy because that's the kind of guy he is. Um, yeah, Cressida says, I'm so glad I made it. Super exciting to be a part of. Thank you so much, Cressida. I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, so her scene partner, let's say, you know, her scene partner is going to be Vince. He's the kind of angry bank robber who is most likely to try and shoot a hostage, voted most likely to shoot a hostage in his high school yearbook. So um, Kitty's first strategy is just, it's just a very unescalated, simply object. She just wants to say, hey, hey, you don't have to shoot him. We're all going to co cooperate. It's going to be okay. Um, and then Vince's strategy to counter this, what is that going to be? Um, you know, I imagine he just, he just kind of gets pissed off. Um, he just gets pissed off. Um, and he, he considers it really a attack on his authority that she thinks she can talk to him about whether or not he's going to shoot this hostage. So he, he kind of gets to a higher level of anger and now he's ready to shoot her instead. Um, and then Kitty's next strategy is maybe, <laughs> logic. Okay, she says, you know, you don't wanna sh start shooting people now. You don't want, all of these hostages panicking and thinking they're going to lose their lives. If you don't shoot him, everybody's going to stay calm. You're going to get what you want and we can all be okay. And yeah, this just takes him to a whole nother level of anger. I feel like now he threatens her directly. Now he's Pointing the gun right at, you know, swings the gun from the bank manager to Kitty. Um, is this is this too much tension for scene number two? Um, don't know. Uh, we're going to we're going to try it. Yeah, Aquarius Al says he is not going to listen to a woman. Yeah, I think absolutely. Like just being talked to by her about this is going to set him off. Honestly. Um, and 
Okay, so what's her next strategy going to be? Because now things are a lot worse. And okay, I can see two possibilities here. And I like them both. So I'm going to lay them out for you and you tell me which makes the better scene. Um, possibility one, Kitty appeals to a higher authority. She can see that Cal is the robber actually giving the orders and keeping the other guys in line. And so she, you know, she calls him over. You, are you going to let this guy shoot me? You don't want a panic. You don't want this to happen. Um, let's get this thing settled. And, um, so that would allow her to actually win the scene. Vince doesn't shoot her, but he is hyper pissed off. He has a special nut against her for the rest of the novella. And, you know, things are really at an escalated, at an escalated level of tension for the rest of the novella. Okay. That's scene possibility number one. Meredith says there was a real crime where a woman was robbed and she handed the robber her lunch to calm him down. Okay. I actually like that. Yes. Um, I think that's something that Kitty could have done at the beginning before Vince got to this escalated level of anger. That's something that she could try um, as like the first strategy, um, like offer him something. He gets pissed off. Then she tries logic. He gets more pissed off. And then either she appeals to Cal's authority, or here's the other thing I like. Mrs. Wilberforce jumps in to save her. Mrs. Wilberforce fakes a, uh, a minor heart attack or other sickness and just manages to diffuse the situation diffuse it enough that Cal can kind of get Vince back under control. Um, so what I like about that is, A, it gives Mrs. Wilberforce a very nice introduction. Immediately we can see who she is. And I imagine in the first scene, she appeared as this very stodgy, disapproving matronly character. And now she's jumping into the fray to save a young woman and it's kind of a nice turnabout. Like, I like that a lot. Um, also, also, if I need one of the hostages to fake an illness later in the book, perhaps so they can stay in a room that they need to be in or so that they can distract the guards, um, this is a nice time to set that up, to set up the you know, to do a minor medical incident so that the later medical incident comes across as more believable. So I don't know. I'm going to read the comments and see what you guys think. Cressida says if she's wrong and Vince won't be controlled, she'd get shot immediately. Could be internal monologue. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, not sure... Uh, let's see. Um, I like her appealing to Cal's authority, but it really depends on which character you want to spotlight Cal or Whistlebottom. <laughs> yeah. Um, Whistlebottom is even, even more humorous than Wilberforce, which, um, which already, I feel like I got to bring it down. Like Windlesham, uh, with, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Throttlebottom. Um, I don't know what her name is. Um, I don't know. They're both good. Uh, the appeal to Cal allows her to start building a rapport with him, which also is a good thing to set up because I think that he is going to, he's going to die and uh, it's going to have a big impact on her. So is there a way I can use both of these? Because I don't want to go back and forth like four times. That's too much. That's way too much tension for this early scene. Um, maybe, so she first objects, Cal gets pissed off, swings the gun on her. Um, that's, that's his first strategy. Just the second she says anything. Then 
second strategy is appeal to Cal with logic, which, you know, as, as somebody set up here, yeah, Cressida said, if she's wrong, that gets her shot immediately. So it's a very dangerous strategy for her to go with, but let's just, let's just go with that for now. Um, no, it's too much. It's too much. Um, appeal. Her strategies are appeal or object, logic, and then it's saved. Now, yeah, I'm having a difficult time deciding with these. Appeal to Cal. And he gets pissed, threatens her directly, and then backs down. So those are going to be his strategy. So the final note in this scene, really final note is just a place for me to remember to bring it back to the consequences of the scene, to dwell on what has changed because this scene happened. How will the book be different because this scene occurred? And yeah, final note is just she see, sees Vince shooting a glare at her and she knows she's uh, she's on his list. Willoughby. A Anne, Anne says her name should be Willoughby. And actually, yes. Anne, that is her name. Her name is Mrs. Willoughby. Anne also says maybe remind robbers that there are cctv cameras watching um so no not in this case because um actually the year is early 1929 so um so that means that a lot of things are unavailable to me cctv uh there's going to be no secretly calling the cops um it's going to be kitty on her own uh with with very little help um and Lisa says, I like Willoughby. Uh, okay, so uh, JC Car author JC Carpenter asks, what is the story about? And it's just about a uh, my character being trapped in a bank during a robbery. So we've kind of planned the first couple of scenes here where she's going to get to the point where the one particular robber has a serious bone to pick with her. Um, and she's kind of going to be in the spotlight. So the next scene I wanted to plan, uh, I called a whole lot of money. And in this scene, I think the bank robbers will take the least threatening of the hostages. So that's going to be the women. That's going to be, um, here I called her Mrs. Abernethy, but she's Willoughby now, Mrs. Willoughby. Mrs. Willoughby, Flora, and Kitty. So two young women and an old woman. Um, are forced to go into the vault and pack money or no better yet. I think they're forced to go into the safety deposit box area. And pack the contents of the safety deposit boxes. And the reason for that is that I want one of these women to um, to be the mastermind, to actually wind up with the item of value. And at first that was going to be cash, but it was simply too bulky. I couldn't imagine either of these women truly managing to secret a huge score of cash in her purse. So we're going to have some actual diamonds in one of the safety deposit boxes. And that means that when I get to clue planning, I will need to explain why the bank robbers knew the diamonds would be in that particular box on this particular day. Um, oh, Anne says in the 1920s, people smoked a lot so she could offer a smoke to help calm them. Um, yeah, that's a great idea, except Kitty doesn't smoke. Kitty. Kitty wouldn't have cigarettes, um, but she could she could nick one from somebody else's breast pocket. Um, 
So yeah, that could be the first thing that she does. To, the kind of very unescalated strategy she uses at the beginning of the scene, where she's really she's really still trying to be on his good side. Um, and author J.C. Carpenter says, "This is my first time here, so hello, hello, hello to you too. Thank you so much for showing up. Um, I hope we're gonna have a lot of fun." Okay, so let's. Okay, so. In this whole lot of money scene, um, you know, what I haven't found is the interest in this scene. How is the story going to develop? Um, so, you know, I have a physical activity for my characters to do, but I don't have any significant dialogue for them to exchange during it. Um, this will probably be a scene where I sew the clues of Flora's eventual betrayal. Um, so I guess what they will do is they will be discussing their backgrounds, you know, you know, um, bad luck to be in the bank on this particular day. And um, I wish I was, you know, I wish I had come the other day. I should be at home with my sister right now. They'll be discussing their backgrounds and there will be clues in that section um on how flora masterminded this whole thing um and while that's happening they will be packing the boxes and what does the character want uh this character does not want in particular to mess with the robbery she doesn't really care if the bank is, i mean i guess she cares a little it's a little terrible for all of these people to be losing their uh their special savings but not so terrible that she's willing to risk her life for it um however she does kind of want to protect her own safety deposit box um but again at the expense of her life uh no it's not worth it um I think she's going to give it some thought. I think she's going to think about trying to make sure her box comes last or something, but she's not, she's not about to just throw her life away for it. So what does she want in this scene? That is what I need. Um, I guess what she wants is that she already um, feels like she has been marked for death for Vin by Vince. He is coming for her. So in this scene, she could want to make one of the other bank robbers into a firm ally to protect her. Um, she could want to look for a method of escape, although that feels unlikely when we're here in the bank vault. Um, Let's see. Is there another thing she could be doing right now to try and preserve her life in the face of a really angry bank robber? Yeah, I think I am going to go with trying to make an ally. So what she wants is to... make an ally out of Cal, the bank robber's leader, or possibly uh, Billy, who is the, the youngest bank robber. We'll go with Cal for now. Uh, does she get it? I feel like the answer here is partially. Um, she kind of makes inroads with him. She kind of gets him to see that she's a human being and to, you know... It, to feel the natural, um, you know, when you see that somebody else is real, obviously you do not want to see them die. Uh, but he's not quite ready to break with Vince and doesn't really see the threat as, uh, as clearly as Kitty does. He, he thinks Vince can be controlled. He just, he can't. Um, so, but she gets some inroads. Okay. So partially, However, 
what is a consequence that she could get for pursuing this goal? Well, she could cause a rift between Cal and Vince. Vince hears them talking and now is pissed at Cal. Yeah, I don't know. Um, she could... Let's see. Um, maybe she begins to make inroads with Cal and then she pushes it a little too far. And now he, you know, he doesn't hate her. Uh, we're not, we're not going to turn it into two robbers who hate her. But he's kind of further away as an ally than he was at the beginning. Um, or possibly she makes some inroads with him and then he separates her from the other women. Um, which gives her the opportunity to do some interesting stuff in the bank offices. However... I'm not sure why he would do that or what exactly it would cost her. Um, I'm going to read the comments here for just a minute. Uh, Anne says, maybe it could be a piece of jewelry as the item pocketed. Yeah, not just a diamond, but an item with some history. So that could be cool. I do imagine it's going to be um, something that was in the papers. Maybe something that is in the very back of Kitty's mind in the first scene. Um, maybe, you know, she's standing there reading a newspaper while um, she's in line, but it's something, it's something grand and um, extremely valuable. Uh, Kitty says, does she maybe want to hatch a plan to stop the robbery? Uh, sorry, did I just call you Kitty? Um, Lisa, Lisa Harris says, uh, does she maybe want to hatch a plan with the, to stop the robbery? I don't, I don't think she's there yet. Like, um, you know, she's got, she's got this eight year old niece at home who she's the caretaker for. I think right now she's pretty focused on getting home alive and stopping the robbery is just, it's just, it's too much for her to contemplate. Like I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there. I'd be focused on getting home. So I think that's where she's going to be right away. Um, Anne says she acts sympathetic with Cal. Sees he has no wedding ring, but used to wear one. Knows he's on the outs with his wife. Okay. So, yeah. So I really like that. Um, I really like the idea of her picking up on some little clue about him. And then she mentions it. And then this destroys the inroads that she's made with him. This uh, causes him to back away from her. And let's see, Meredith asked, does Cal feel a bit of attraction to her? And then he catches himself and is angry that she distracted him. So yes, this is, this is the same sort of thing that I was just discussing with Anne's suggestion is that we get close to an allyship, but then further away because things got too hot and heavy, either because she know something about him or because he's attracted to her or for whatever reason. Um, Anne says, that, so the item is the MacGuffin? Yes, the item is the MacGuffin. And what I imagine, what I imagine actually is just loose diamonds, just like a, a you know, velvet sack that Kitty peers inside at some point and, oh, diamonds, diamonds. Um, Leslie, oh, Leslie, Leslie and Anne says, uh, maybe because he doesn't want any harm to come to her in case things go down with the other hostages, or he doesn't want her revealing what he's told her to other hostages. Okay. Yes. If Cal told her, if Cal accidentally told her something identifying, something that would get him pinched later on, that's really going to put them on the outs. So yeah. We'll say that the answer to this is partially however they wind up farther apart. Um, activity is going to be just packing the boxes. And um, to keep in mind, okay, here's where I need Flora's 
introduction. Um, Flora, oh, Mrs. Willoughby did not get an introduction in that first one. We went with the different option. So, um, but in any event, I'm not going to do more than one character intro in this scene. But Flora needs to get a real introduction. She needs to have an action. She needs to evoke our emotions. And ideally, it's visually interesting. So what is Flora's action at the beginning of this? Like, Hmm. Um, so I feel like maybe Flora is the one who says she wants to stop the bank robbery. No, no. Um, maybe Hmm. Okay, so Anne says, remind me, what is Flora's role in the overall storyline? Okay, Flora's role is that she's the mastermind. So she is probably a um, secretary at the firm that the diamonds were stolen from, or um, she's a secretary for some firm that did business with the robbers in some way. But either way, she knows the diamonds have been stolen. She knows where they've been taken. Um, so she set up this robbery and her goal is to get the robbers actually killed trying to escape. And um, she winds up with the diamonds. Um, although to be honest, there is no reason at this point why that character could not be Mrs. Willoughby. Um, which is a little more surprising, right? So what What if Flora is sort of our obvious mastermind and Mrs. Willoughby is our secret surprise mastermind? Is that too crazy? Does that, often when I change the ending of a book, I have the feeling that it'll seem super twisty to the reader, but sometimes it just seems that way because I have just encountered a surprise. I have been surprised by my ending. And so I think it'll play that way to the reader. Um, okay. So right now, either Flora or Mrs. Willoughby is the mastermind. Um, let me know in the comments if you have a preference, but Flora, let me talk about who Flora is. I have picture Flora as a sweet looking kind of white blonde hair, very 1920s. Um, young woman who at least seems a little bit shy, a little bit fragile. Um, and yeah, I imagine she's just this, you know, secret mastermind who's got everything figured out. Um, so the natural introduct, the natural kind of action for her to take is, okay, what if at this point she exhibits fear and secretly, you won't know this at the time, but secretly uses that in some way to stash the diamonds, uses this moment to stash the diamonds. You know, they're opening boxes. Um, and Flora kind of freaks out and, um, the other women are comforting her and they, um, turn their backs to get her some water, to go ask for water for her. And they don't know that during that time she stashed the diamonds in her purse. Ah. Uh, And Anne says she does something physical to distract the hostages, seeing some aspect of the crime, maybe trips because of her shoes or something klutzy. Uh, shy woman would do physical distraction versus verbal. I love that. That is a great point, Anne. 
Um, Meredith says Mrs. Willoughby as one of the robbers' moms. Okay, so this is a twist where we don't know Mrs. Willoughby is one of their moms. We think that she is just a hostage with all the rest. Um, but in fact, she is working with her son to pull off this robbery and presumably to, to screw over his <clears throat> accomplices because she's going to wind up with the diamonds and they're going to wind up with nothing. Um, Anne says while hugging her to comfort her, she slips the item in her purse unnoticed. The other person's body hides her hands. Okay. And I think what you meant is <clears throat> she slips the item in her own purse. But interestingly, what if she slipped it into Kitty's purse? What if, can we figure out a way where that works? Where she, um, where she slips the diamonds into, I think their purses have been taken away at this point, where she slips the items into Kitty's cardigan pocket in the intention of with the intention of being able to retrieve them later in which case it's not loose diamonds because that's um it it would be too hard to retrieve it's like all these little bobbly bits that you have to scoop up um but yeah let's say that definitely at this point Flora is going to secretly stash the diamonds while distracting the other women and making them worry about her and try to help her. Um, so, yeah. So in this scene, we don't really have a back and forth strategy thing. Uh, we just have, you know, Flora's strategy is to stash the diamonds and Kitty doesn't notice. And or it's probably a necklace at this point if if we're stashing it on Kitty's person. Um, final note. Um, so maybe this scene has skipped us ahead too much because what it would be lovely as the final note of this scene is um, they open one of the boxes and <gasps> there is the most amazing diamond necklace you've ever seen. Um, you know, and so maybe we don't have Flora do that in this scene just yet. Maybe the final note is there's the diamond and the, the things that happen in the scene are a little bit less active um we still need something to happen though here so i guess this scene is largely about kitty trying to make inroads with cal uh getting pushed back when things get a little too personal and um yeah flora flora's um flora's strategy here is just going to be to build rapport with kitty and mrs willoughby she's just going to be trying to position herself as this sweet baby bird who they're going to feel like they need to be protective of. So let's say action is to position self as needing protection. Um, we feel pity and... I do, I do really like my intros to be visually interesting, but sometimes it's hard to get there. Um, we're going to leave that one for now. Um, Anne says, is the item at the end of the scene a false item? They think it's what they were looking for, but Flora swapped out the actual item. Mm, no, I think when we first see it, it's going to be real. And that's so I can say how much it glimmers and how heavy it is and how, you know, it's going to be very real. And, um, and I, I want to be able to describe it in a way that people can believe in it. So I think, um, I think first time real, 
And then later Kitty will be able to see a fake of it because that's, that's probably going to be Flora's plan. Um, slip a fake into the robber's bags, keep the real one for herself. Um, okay. So this, uh, so to be honest, I didn't think it would take quite this long to get through the planning of three scenes. Um, that's where we are right now. It's about five minutes um, till the top of the hour. So I'm going to keep going for a little bit and we'll try and plan out the next scene, um, which is, I think there's a rift between the robbers. Uh, Cal is having a hard time keeping Vince in line. So I imagine Kitty first, Kitty's off in the vault. She's packing safety deposit boxes. So she's first going to become aware of this rift when she hears yelling out in the bank lobby. Um, and at that point, she needs to spin up a new want, which is to find a place to hide. Um, you know, maybe she hears this yelling and she's convinced Vince is going to come in here and shoot me right now. So, um, hey, sweetheart, I'm sorry. Mommy's doing a live stream. Can, can you wait about 15 minutes? You can't find Miles? Yeah. He's not downstairs or in his room? No, he's not even in his room. Okay. Well, um, my eight-year-old is missing, and I'm sure he's fine. But since it is the top of the hour, um, <clears throat> I am going to go ahead and sign off. So this is three stories planned from my novella, and um, there's about four, maybe four and a half more scenes to plan. So I let me know in the comments if you want me to work on that in public again, um, or if you want to just move on to something else with our next live stream. Bye-bye.